Hey, uh, before we get into uh, the message this morning, um, there's a couple projects that uh, end of the year projects giving opportunity. I'm going to share one each week. I may not share one de- December 8th, but I'm going to share one each week of some opportunities to give. And uh, 2 Corinthians says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. So God gives us blessing so we can be a blessing. And the more we are a blessing, God says, I'm going to give you more, so I'm going to, you can keep blessing. And so th- there's a couple of um, so widows and single moms. Every year we give um, money to widows and single moms, which I think single moms are kind of widows today. And, and uh, we give them financially, bless them so they can go buy Christmas presents and all this kind of stuff. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. We are, um, praise God, uh, we, we have made some decisions to move probably by summer of next year, blowing this wall out and building on to the sanctuary. So give God praise for that. I'll talk about that. But one thing I wanted to talk about for just a second is um, we went to this uh, event called Israel Summit. And uh, it was highlighting ministry, we, last, not last week, not this past week. I never know which, which, which is last week. Is was Friday last week or was the week before last week? I don't know. I say next and I always get in trouble with that. Next week and that means, no, that's the next coming up one. So anyway, two weeks ago, uh, we went to this Israel Summit and it was so powerful. There's 75 ministries that highlighted several of them that are boots on the ground in Israel. Um, you know, obviously they're in the middle of war and we need to be praying for them. Um, and, uh, you know, God, God has a heart for the, Isra- is the Jewish people, doesn't he? And uh, I read this last week. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus was Jewish. The gospel came out of the Jewish nation. The word of God came out of the Jewish nation. In Genesis it says, he will bless those who bless Israel. He will bless those who bless Israel. And so, um, so when we're at this summit, they shared some of the things. And what, what I love about we're firm is who we, uh, we give towards or, or we partner with. They give 100% of the proceeds. Their job is the middleman, but they don't take any of the fine fun, funding. Uh, they actually just are a help, help get it to ministries. And there were several ministries. I want to highlight a couple of them um, that, uh, that we gave to. Uh, we, we pledged about $16,000 to help some of these ministries. They raised a couple of million. I mean, it was crazy what, what they did. So we're a small part. But I, I, I wanted to say, you know, most of that money was not in our missions budget. So I wanted to give us an opportunity to give towards these things as a church. So a couple things that we gave, were, that we pledged to, a crisis pregnancy. They're going to build a crisis pregnancy center. Uh, one in five Israelis uh, abort their babies. And um, part, can you imagine what's going on? They're in the middle of war. They're going to bomb shelters every single day. Can you think what they're going? I don't want to raise a kid in this. And so this crisis, pre- it's, not, it's not named crisis pregnancy, but, but you kind of understand that uh, language. But they have a ministry there to help people, uh, girls, get out of sex trafficking, to get out of prostitution, and, and those who are um, having babies out of wedlock and don't know what else to do and plan to give them to, you know, to be aborted. And they help them, set them you know, g- give them an opportunity to, to have that baby adopted and taken care of. So we pledge money for that. We pledged money for a, this is, this is kind of wild for me, I never heard it, a new Bible translation in modern Hebrew. We think, you know, they speak Hebrew in Israel, and a lot of people speak English, but they speak Hebrew. But you, didn't, you might not know that, you, that they can't actually read the ancient Hebrew. They actually don't have the ability, I mean, they can read it. Have you, anybody ever got an old English something from like the 14, 1500s? I mean, you can hardly read a word it says. Well, that's what they're reading. And they don't have a translation in modern Hebrew. Do you know that? And so they've just finished a translation, and we gave to help distribute that to churches, and they're going to use it as an evangelism tool. And, and then the final need I want to just talk about, I'm going to play a video to just share what, what that's about. So we're, we're here looking over Lebanon. We're driving along the border to a community called Manala. This community has been evacuated for over a year since October 8th of last year. And um, now it's a completely military zone. The anti-tank missiles are fired straight direct into houses, 
at civilians, at cars, so we have to be uh, extremely careful right now. We are literally on the border between Israel and Lebanon. Just a few hundred feet from me this direction, I could see Lebanon. They're firing directly at these homes. And this entire community has been evacuated now for over a year. These homes that are on the front ridge facing Lebanon, all of them have been damaged by anti-tank missiles that have been fired directly at the homes. The Iron Dome can prevent against rockets, but these anti-tank missiles go directly. And as you can see from the home behind me, this was a direct hit by an anti-tank missile. This home belongs to a family. The parents lived above. The daughter and the babies lived downstairs. And these people have been out of their homes now for a long time. They want to return to their homes. What could we do? How could we help them come back to their communities? And they showed us a piece of land, a piece of land on the other side of the kibbutz. This side is not facing Lebanon. This is the side facing Israel. It's on the other side of the hill. It's not in a direct line of sight of the anti-tank missiles or um, Hezbollah. And they said, well, if we give you the land and we provide all the road work and the plumbing and the sewage and everything, will you help us build these homes? And we said, we, we want to. We want to help build 50 homes here. Now, how can we do this quickly? In Israel, this would typically take years and years. We believe that we can go purchase manufactured homes out of China. We've been to China, we've seen the factory, all the preparations are made, and they'll ship these homes to Israel, we'll bring them to this community and place them here. We'll build bomb shelters attached to each home, and this will become the place where these families can start to return to their community. They'll be able to live in those homes for two to three years as their homes, like the one behind me, are being rebuilt. So while they're being repaired, they'd live in these temporary homes, and after they're back into their permanent homes, these temporary homes will become affordable housing units for young families, families, other Israelis, young students that need a place to live in Israel. So I'm going to ask you to join us on this crazy journey. We've never done something like this before, but over the last year, we've completed over 35 construction projects across the country, and we feel like God's calling us now to help this community, the community of Menara, return to their homes and strengthen Israel's northern border. Powerful, huh? So, um, Michael's been here, you know, and uh, we trust him. And uh, I want to ask, um, we, anything we give that comes in, we'll, come, we'll, we'll send everything if it's more. But, you know, if everybody in here just gave 50 bucks, we would meet that need that we're, we've asked, we've pledged. So right in front of your QR code there, I would ask you, would you consider and ask the Lord? I'm going to pray over this. Would you ask the Lord? Just scan the QR code, give. There's a drop-down menu that says Israel. Anything that comes in today, we're going to send, send that way. So let's, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Father, for the nation of Israel that has brought the Word of God and has brought Jesus, our Savior. And Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel. Come on, let's pray. The peace of Israel. Lord, we pray the fighting stop immediately, Lord. We pray, Lord, the evil be thwarted and be pulled out in Jesus' name, God. And Lord, we pray, Lord, as we give, as we have taken opportunity to give into this, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bless us as we bless. And we don't do it for blessing, but Lord, because we are blessing them, Lord, we know that you'll continue to supply seed to the sower to be able to bless more, God. We pray your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. It's been a while since we've been in John. Kind of fun. You ready to get back into it? Yep. Well, um, let's remember some of the themes. We're in John chapter 10. Let's remember some of the themes we're in. So we, uh, you know, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. My sheep hear my voice. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Some of these, these are the themes in this chapter. Um, we have been talking about, we talked a while about, I can, you know, we can hear the voice of God. I want everybody to say this. I can hear his voice. I can hear his voice. Sheep hear his voice. And uh, so today we're going to be asking a really kind of uh, loaded question. Can a person lose their salvation? You ready for this talk? Uh, we're not going to spend the whole time on that. But, uh, but it is. we're going to ask the question. Let's get into it. Let's stand up for the reading of God's word. Acts 
At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, Well, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. Well, then the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptized at first, and there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So, Holy Spirit, we ask you to open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. We ask you to open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying in this word. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, this is during Hanukkah. It's wintertime. This is part two of this message, if you can remember it a month ago. (laughs) I'm sure you remember all the words. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, The Jewish authorities are asking him plainly. Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responds, Well, look at all the works I've done. I've already told you. I've healed the sick, raised the dead, proclaimed the kingdom of God. All those things are clearly prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah would do these things. But Jesus knew. He says, You don't really want to know the truth. Uh, You don't really want to believe. You're not one of my sheep. You're trying to trap me. That's all they were trying to do. And so he said, You need to come to your own conclusions Because I I think what I've done is very clear. And the Messiah is prophesied that he would do those things. So we're going to really focus almost all the time on verses 28, 29. I give them eternal life. No one can snatch them. It's going to be a fun discussion. But before I do this, I want to dive in, quickly reference this last part. Because sometimes you ever read something in the Bible and you're like, I have no clue what that's talking about. Okay. Only me. All the time. Well, here at the end, you read this little thing. Your scripture says you are God's. What in the world is Jesus talking about? So let, let's, let's talk about that real quick. He says, um, uh, Jesus is making a claim that he's God. If you never, if people say he never made a claim that he was God, he made a claim. They knew exactly. There's, that's why they're trying to stone him. And he says that, and he says, well, hold on, hold on. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? And Jesus makes a really important statement here. The scripture cannot be broken. Jesus saying every word in the scripture is true. And of course, he knew that they had a high view of the word of God. And he's actually using the the, the argument against them. Um, Let me just say this about our church. Uh, We believe every word of the scriptures are true. If you don't believe that, then you start opening yourself up to, well, maybe a little bit of that's true, maybe a little bit of that's not true. And who's the one who makes the decision? No. Every word has a purpose in the Bible. There's a reason why every word is in this book. And um, we need to wrestle with that. We have to wrestle with that sometimes. We don't just throw it out. We conform our minds, our thoughts, and our wills to this word, not the other way around. 
And so Psalm 82 says this, I said you are God's son of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So the context of this whole is, verse is, Jesus is talk, or God is talking to the, the Jewish people that he gave the word of God to. And they became judges with the word of God over the people. And he's basically saying, you're like little gods running around. You, you have the power and authority that I've given you with the word of God. So Jesus is not using this to authenticate himself. He's just using their own high view of God's word to to see their error of their thinking. He's basically saying, hey, look, in your own word, you call yourself gods, those who have the law, those who are judge judges over the land. You call the Bible says you're God's son of the most high judges in the land. So if I come doing the works of God and I call myself the son of God, I don't get it. The word of God even calls you gods. And so, um, of course, they were just arguing with the author. (laughs) Jesus wrote the book and they're arguing with him. I mean, but you know what? We still do it today, don't we? Psalm, Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage? They're raging against their God. Jesus, flesh and blood, the author of this book is sitting there telling them the truth. And they're like, yeah, that's not true. That's not true. So that's, that's kind of what that was about. But I want to get back into the big question of the day. So verse 28 says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What a beautiful picture of the security of the believer. Two hands are on the believer. It says, Jesus says, I got my hand on the believer. No one can snatch. And the Father has his hand on the believer. No one can snatch. What a beautiful picture of the security of the believer. And this is one of the verses that is used quite often to, to uh, go to, you know, once saved, always saved. The eternal security of the believer. And I think it's a very good uh, scripture for that. And um, But before we answer the question, can a person lose their salvation, we have to ask a few other questions that I think are really important. What is eternal life and what really is salvation? We got to really know what does it really mean to be saved? What does it really mean to be one of his? Right? What does it really mean to be a sheep of Jesus that he won't allow the enemy to snatch from? So he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. So what is that? Well, Christ, this is the main reason he came to the earth, right? John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not what? But have what? Eternal life. God sent his son for this eternal life. So um, eternal life does not mean that some people will live and some people will cease to live. Okay? That's not what that meaning. Every being that is created in the mother's womb as soon as it's created has a soul as a spirit now i want you to think about that let that sink in for a second as soon as a baby is created it has a eternal destiny forever as soon as a baby is created that soul will live forever So what does this Bible say will happen to every soul or spirit? We can use those interchangeably sometimes. The Bible does. Um, When anyone dies, they immediately go, from our understanding of Scripture, the best we can understand, they go to two temporary places. Okay? Depending on whether they accepted Christ or not, they go to two temporary places. First, the believer is immediately in the presence of God in heaven. That's what, that's what the scripture says. So uh, 2 Corinthians 5 says, So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. As soon as we die, as a believer in Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, you go to heaven to be with the Lord. Now that's a temporary place. We'll find out in a second. Maybe you already know that. But it's a temporary place. Unbelievers who have not been born again, who have not surrendered their life to Christ, who have not allowed Jesus to pay the penalty of their sin, go to another temporary place called Hades. 
And uh, in Luke 16, we read of a story. It's, this is not a parable. Jesus does not call this a parable. He calls it a story of a rich man and Lazarus, a poor man. Now, this is different than the Lazarus he raises from the dead, which we'll be talking about next week. But um, they go to two different places. Now listen, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Okay? The rich man also died and was buried. Now when people die before Jesus, they couldn't go to heaven because... They still had sin. Jesus had to forgive them of their sin. And they had to be washed clean in order to be with per- in perfection in heaven. So the rich man also died and was buried in Hades. Being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So part of this story is there's this huge chasm between Abraham's side of the righteous and this chasm on the other side, which is called Hades, where they're in term- torment and flames. And he says, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. So what we understand, and we'll get into into Revelation here in just a second. When someone dies without Christ, they go to this holding place of Hades that's torment. And um, the Bible says that when Jesus was raised from the dead, he actually went down to this other side, Abraham's side, and he set the prisoners free. He preached to them, and he, and he brought them to heaven to be with, Jesus, with God in heaven because now his sacrifice had paid the penalty for them to be with God. Hades is not the final place of torment. So when Jesus returns to the earth, are you guys interested in this? Is this good? Okay. The Bible says believers who have died and are still living at the time after the tribulation, when he resurrects, when he comes, I'm sorry, comes back to the earth, we will receive these glorified, resurrected bodies. And uh, we look at Jesus, and that, that's, that's an example of what our bodies is going to look like. We're going to be able to eat and drink, but be able to go through walls and fly. I'm sure that's going to be in your book, huh? Okay. I can't wait to read it. Uh, so we're going to have these incredible bodies. I mean, it's going to be amazing. They're, they're not going to wear out. They're going to last forever. We're not going to have knee pain. We're not going to get... It's going to be amazing. And Jesus will set up his earthly kingdom here in, or on this earth and in Jerusalem. And he will rule and reign. The Bible talks about a thousand year reign. A thousand year reign where Satan will be locked up. He'll be locked away for this thousand year. After the tribulation, he comes back. He sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. There's a thousand year reign with Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, ruling over the earth. Pretty awesome, huh? Evil will be locked up. There will be us that are Christians with with, uh, glorified bodies, resurrected bodies. And there will be mortal people that still live. They made it through the tribulation. And they will continue to live. And the Bible talks that they will live for very long. They'll have babies. They'll get married and all this kind of stuff. At the end of thousand years, Satan will be let out. He'll be let out. And he will deceive those mortal people. Now think about this. These people have had Jesus as the king for a thousand years. King, the perfect king over their world. And they still are going to be deceived by Satan. And they're going to form an uprising against him. I mean, that just shows you that no matter what God has done, some people are just bent to go against God. And so he lets out, and there will be this one last battle, but it's going to be very, very short-lived. And let me just let you know, give you the the cliff notes, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. At the end of that thousand-year reign, there will be a white throne judgment. Uh, Believers will not be judged here. We've already been um, given our life to Christ. We've already been judged. Uh, We're we're, we're with Jesus. And uh, we've received eternal life. We've already been given our rewards. But at the end of this, there will be a a judgment for only unbelievers. And here's what Revelation tells us. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to them, according to what they had done. So death and Hades gave up their dead. So these people that were in Hades, they come up to the white throne judgment. And it says, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is their final place of torment. 
It's serious business, guys. This should be very sobering to us. We should do everything within our power to reach as many people as we can for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want that. And when Jesus says eternal life, he's saying those who have accepted the sacrifice of Jesus will experience this abundant life forever with God and perfection. And those who have not will experience an eternal death and torment. And you know, um, the lake of fire of hell was not made for humans. It was made for Satan. But because of our disobedience and um, sin, that's where people go. And God does not send people to hell that he's angry with. Okay? Um, he loves every person. Hell is the place people go to say, I, know, I, don't, I want to pay for my own sins. I don't want Jesus to pay for them. I want to pay for my own sins. And, and God says, okay. You can't be with me because I'm in perfection. So Jesus is saying in this passage, when we talk about eternal life, I, I want you to think about that for a second. He's saying, I give them believers, my sheep, the ones who follow me and hear my voice, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No outside force is going to snatch them away. Forever, they will be with me in eternity. It is secure. It's, we can count on it forever. We don't have to be afraid. Come on, let's give God praise for that. They are mine. They are protected. They are my sheep. So the question here is, can a person who truly is a Christian lose their salvation? Meaning God loses them like he loses keys. Well, the answer is no. The answer is no, we are safe within the hands of our Savior. But we need to ask our question, another question. Was that person that turned away truly saved in the first place? Or can a believer forfeit his salvation and say, God can't lose me, but I choose to give it back. I don't want the gift. You can't lose me, God. I... God's not going to lose you. I, I've got you safe. But you say, I choose to forfeit. I choose to give it back. So we've we got to look at the scripture. Okay, We can't just be what we've heard. We've got to look at the scripture. What's it say? All right. So there's two camps of thinking. All right, And there's a lot of people in the middle. Strong arguments, I think, for both sides. Um, the first question I would ask, why would anybody even want to get close to find out? Would Josh say, don't even try it. Don't try it. Don't even get close to ask, have to be asking the question. But let, let's go into it. One camp would say, you can't earn your salvation. Because you can't earn your salvation, it's God's gift. There's nothing you can do for forfeit it. Because you, how can you forfeit something that you didn't do to gain anyway? Um, that if someone turns away, it's because they were re never really saved in the first place. They had a form of Christianity... Uh, but there was never a true surrender, a heart change, a born-again experience. People will end up going to heaven, but they will miss out on heavenly rewards. And let me just say something about this. Some people say, well, I'm just glad to get to heaven. I don't care about rewards. Well, if Jesus cared about rewards, we should care about rewards. We shouldn't be walking around, well, I don't care. Jesus is like, hey, when you pray, better do it in secret. Don't let, if, if everybody's watching you pray, you don't get a reward for that. If you fast, do it in secret. Because you want a reward. He's constantly talking about rewards. So we should worry or think about rewards and want that. So, so that's one side. The other camp would say, well, scriptures seem to say a person can for, forfeit their salvation. They can say, I don't want this anymore. I deny Christ. I reject him. So first, before we get into this question, we need to ask the real question. What really is salvation? What is it? What does it mean to be saved? What is true saving faith? I'll use that term. Is it only just a prayer that's prayed at an altar call? Emotional moment? Maybe it's a, just a, is it just a belief system? Well, I'm a Christian. My, maybe it's a family affair. Well, my family's all been a Christian. I'm a Christian. Is that all it is? What constitutes as true born-again saving faith? So I'm gonna, I got a ton of scriptures today. Okay, you ready? You ready with me back there, Diana? Okay, she's going to be fast, fast on it. All right. John 3.3 3 says, I tell you the truth, unless you are, everybody say, born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, the first question, or the first thing about being saved, we have to, there needs to be a born again experience. 
you got to be born again. We'll talk about what that means in a second. But Ephesians 2.8 says, For by the grace you have been saved through faith, this is not your own doing. It is a what? Gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's by faith. So there's nothing you can do. You're not, you're not, you're not trying to earn your way to heaven. You're not just doing good, do, it's not by being a good person and doing good works and saving the planet. Okay, we're not going to get there. You're not going to get to heaven by that. It's maybe good stuff to do, but that's not what, get, what gets you to heaven. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 5.8 But God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more... Sh- much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. From the wrath of God. Before you did anything, Jesus said, I love you and I forgive you. Now you have to accept that forgiveness before you've done anything for him. Let, me, let that sink in for a second. Before you've done anything, before you served in the kids ministry, he loved you and forgave you. Of course, you've got to accept that. But... Let me ask, did you, did you have a role in your physical birth? Did you birth yourself with your mama? No? So God even enables you to even say yes to him. He enables you to say, yes, I follow you. I mean, without God, you got nothing. He enables you to say, yes, it's a supernatural work of the Spirit. Is that my phone? Okay. Okay. Sounded like my, my, my ring. Now, I'm not going to get into Calvinism and Arminianism. Don't worry. We're not, we're not going to get into that. But I probably hit a little bit on that. Now, listen to this. Famous verse, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and what? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So, okay, belief is not just, I believe that this happened. Belief is putting, like, I believe that this chair exists. I've said this before. But until I, biblical belief is I'm sitting on it and I'm trusting in it. So you confess with your mouth what's really going on in your heart that you believe. You have trusted Jesus with all your heart and you say, I want you to be God of my life. I'm tired of running the race by myself. I, 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 I can't do it all. All you need to do is cry out to God. But the test of that faith is in the fruit of your life. How do you know that it's really real and genuine? We'll read this in a second, but Paul says you need to examine your faith to find out, is it genuine? How do you do that? Well, it's the fruit. It's not your deeds that keep you saved. It's not the deeds that get you saved. It's faith alone. James 2, though, says, By faith itself, if it does not have works, it is what? Dead. What is works? What, is, what, what, what does it mean? Faith without works. What are the works? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit inside you. An apple tree should produce apples, right? Christians should produce things that look like Jesus. Can you see Christ working in your life? I want you to think about I want you to take a little bit of an inventory today. Can you see Christ working in your life? This doesn't mean we're saved by works. It doesn't mean that faith plus works equals salvation. That's not what James is saying. He's saying, though, faith without an outward expression of Jesus is like an apple tree with no apples. You have no clue what kind of tree you got in front of you. And, you, and when you don't have an expression of the, of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, people are like, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, yeah, I am. I don't see any of that coming out of you. Should be fruit. Remember, born again means you are a new creation. So it's not Jeff anymore. It's, I'm not a better version of Jeff. I'm a totally different Jeff. I'm a saved Jeff. Right? You're a saved Aiden back here. Come on. So, the Holy Spirit is inside you. He gets deposited in you. Ezekiel and Jeremiah both give these prophecies about a new covenant that's happening, which God's going to give you a new heart. Okay? A new heart. 
You're going to want to do things that Jesus asked you. You're going to want to move towards Christ. You're going to want to go to church. You're going to want to be honest. You're going to want to love God. You're going to want to love people. You're going to want to pray. You're going to want to read God's word. You want to do good works. There should be spiritual gifts flowing out of you. I don't know where that came from, but man, I, was, I met somebody recently here that's just on fire for Jesus. You know what? He's like, I got to tell somebody. I just got to tell somebody. Where's that come from? That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I got to tell somebody. I just, I just, I, I, I can't, I can't sit still. I got to tell somebody about Jesus. Come on, Lord, let that all be on us. <laughs> let us all have that heart. A few years ago, I had a, a, a couple that had given their life to Jesus, and I was, I was discipling them. We were just meeting a few times, and I might have shared this before. I can't remember, but, um, but, but we'd met. They'd been saved for like two weeks, and I met them, and they, I said, well, what's going on? What's God doing in your life? And they said, well, we talked last night. We're really selfish with our money, and we need to start giving more money away. I was like, whoa. I hadn't talked to them about tithe. I mean, that wasn't the first thing we talked about. I said, what? He goes, yeah, we just feel like we need to be generous. We, we feel guilty and convicted that we're, not, we're just using all our money for ourselves. Where does that come from? Do you think a normal person just thinks, hey, I need to be giving more money away? I'm very selfish. No. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit saying, something ain't right. I'm not being a blessing to other people. Some might ask, well, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, here, here's... Here's the best that I know to tell. You confess Jesus. You believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. You ask his blood to cover your sin and make you right with God. And then the fruit or the result of that should be you have experienced a heart change. You should start experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You should be maturing. You should look more like Jesus this year than you did last year. Okay? not perfect we're not talking about perfect i'm just saying growing growing and maturing in that there should be a conviction of sin you you, a a, a person who's really has the holy spirit inside you do stuff and the holy spirit's like i i'm like i something's I, i that's not right i shouldn't have done that i feel really bad how many have ever like walked away from something and just feel grieved to the holy spirit like i can't believe i just did that i mean you are it's like it could be something, and, and other people are like, what's the big deal? It's no big deal. Be like, it, you know, just let it go. I mean, it, it's something as simple as I knew that there, I, I got guacamole, and they didn't charge me at Chipotle. <laughs> and I'm grieved that I didn't say something about it. I let it go. Well, they couldn't see it was under the salad, the lettuce. <laughs> Everybody else that's non-Christian says, oh, just let it go, no big deal. The Holy Spirit inside says, no, you need to go back and pay for that. That ain't right. You you lied. Where does that come from? That's the fruit of the whole. That's conviction of sin. You should have repented of your sins. Repented doesn't mean I feel sorry. I'm sorry I got caught. It's I feel the the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I was headed one way, and now I'm completely turning the opposite direction and going towards Jesus. You should have a burden for the lost. You have a love for people. You can know that you are saved. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible talks about that that's the seal to the day of redemption. You can know that the Spirit of God is living inside of you by the fruit that's coming out of your life. The parable of the sower and the seed tells us, Jesus tells us that this is the most important parable of all the parables. Because it really has to do with this salvation experience. And it, it, there's four types of soil. And I think we have a little picture of up there. You have the path. So a farmer goes out, he sows seed. Some of it falls along the path, you know, where it's, it's, it's dirt and rocks. Some falls on stony ground. Some th- falls on thorny ground. And some falls on good soil. And then in Matthew, he gives us... The interpretation of this parable to help us understand. Look, listen here. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in the heart. This is what was sown along the path. So there we got, got the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word 
and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. He endures for a while, and when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, he indeed bears fruit, and he yields in one case a hundredfold, another sixty, and another thirty. So some people, you, you, you share the word of God, and it just goes in one ear and out the other. They're like, you guys are crazy, you're just a Jesus freak, right? And we've all talked to people, like, I don't understand it. That's, you, you're putting this, the, the, the word is being sown, but it just falls on this path, it, ha, it takes no root, that person has no saving faith. But here's where it gets a little tricky. Some hear it and receive it. This is the rocky ground. They come down to the altar. They raise their hand. They get fired up. They may even get baptized. But maybe their life is in trouble when they make this commitment. But things get all better and they just kind of go back to their old life. They just needed God and they, they needed something to happen right then. Sometimes we've talked about people want to... Uh, get better before they want to be better, right? Just get things better. They accept Christ maybe in an emotional way, but never count the cost. They're excited, but they never allow the roots to go down deep to produce saving faith. This means they don't actually repent. They don't actually turn away from their sin. They don't really follow wholeheartedly to Christ. They don't allow the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin and, and begin to follow Him. Many times these people, they get saved, but they never pick up their Bible. They never read. They never do anything to really help the roots go down deep and spend time with God. It was an experience, but never takes hold of their lives. As soon as a bump in the road happens, as soon as a little persecution happens, they're out. And all of a sudden you're like, what happened to so-and-so? I never heard from him. According to Scripture, this is not saving faith. Then there's the other seed. That falls among the thorns. People hear the word of God, but the lure of the world is a trap. Wealth, influence, distractions choke out the word of God, and it keeps from bearing fruit. This could be either not saving faith, or it could be what we talked about a while ago, a saving faith, but has no fruit that bears um, their works, there's no, there's no good works. Their, their works will be burned up. There will be no rewards in heaven. Uh, 1 Corinthians thirteen says, or 3.13 says, On the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. Okay? The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through the walls of flames. Saying this person barely makes it to heaven. And these are people who barely make it in, but all their works are burnt up because they had wrong motives, selfish motives. They live for themselves. Thank God Jesus knows the heart. Because there's going to be a lot of people in heaven where we're going to get up there and go, whoa, how in the world did you get up here? <laughs> I know you. How'd you get up here? And there's going to be some people who will be looking around everywhere for them and go, where are they? It's sobering. Of course, the last group hears the word and responds and bears fruit of salvation. At what point does... True faith become, or at what point does it become saving faith, a born-again experience? Gosh, who knows? Only God knows. I've known people who've gotten saved, they've raised their hand, and literally, they, like the next day, they're like a different person. I've also known people that made a decision at 15, gave their life to Christ, got baptized, And then now they're 30, 35 years old and say, you know what? I never really knew what I was doing. And something happened last week. And everything changed. And I like, I got this love and passion and care for Jesus. I'm like, I never had this before. According to the Bible, that's when they would have had saving faith. 
because the fruit of that would have begun to take place in their word, in their life. So let's get back to the original discussion, all right? That's what salvation is. True saving faith. And I'm not naive to think that there's people in here that, that uh, don't have true saving faith. Lisa Swayze, a good friend of mine, used to use the word, they're lost in the house. They're in the house, but they're not, they don't actually know Jesus. And I'm not here to judge anybody. That's between you and the Lord, but you need to take an inventory of your life today. So can a person forfeit their salvation? Well, we've been seeing all these people go through deconstruction, right? We've seen Marty Sampson... Um, go through deconstruction. He was a part of Hillsong, wrote a lot of songs we would sing, and now he says, I, I don't believe any of that stuff. We, we've, we've seen Joshua Harris, who wrote I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Anybody read that when they were young? I read it. Now he says, that's all hogwash. I don't believe any of that stuff. On and on. Did they have true saving faith? Or were they never saved at the fir- in the first place? Judas Iscariot was with Jesus for three years. He was sent out. He was doing the stuff. He was healing the sick. He was praying for the lost. He was doing all that kind of stuff. And Jesus says, you got a demon. Satan filled his heart. Matthew 7, 22 says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, many, many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Ah. Oh. Just because someone says they're a Christian doesn't mean they're Christian. Just because someone wears a cross around their neck doesn't mean they're Christian. Just because they got the fish on the back of their car doesn't mean they're Christian. Just because you grew up going to church, pray over meals, even if you read devotionals every day, doesn't mean you're a Christian. Those things are all great stuff. But none of those are the real test of salvation. Have you confessed Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to Him? And is there fruit? coming out of your life? Do you see Christ working in your life? So there's these verses about the security of the believers, salvation. Those verses are compelling, and there's this resounding yes and amen. Yes, there is the security for the believer. But also we have these warning scriptures. So I'm going to read both. I'm going to read both. I'm going to let you decide. I I have a little opinion at the end, but I'm going to read both, okay? Okay. So we read John 10, 23. Nothing can snatch them from the Father's hand. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. For God's gift and His call can never be withdrawn. What is salvation? It's a gift. But that's a pretty strong argument there. Romans 8, 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither net death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today, nor our worries for about tomorrow... Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Man, that's a good word. No power in the sky above or in earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everybody said amen to that. That's a good word. Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Jude 21, 24, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. We should walk in confidence and joy in the security of our salvation we have in Christ. Some people are fearful a lot of times. They think, man, I didn't confess all the sins that I had last night. Am I going to hell? Look, how could you even know all the sins you did yesterday? You know what you confess? You confess the ones that the Holy Spirit convicts you about. That's how you do it. But let me just say this. The grace of God is way beyond anything we can comprehend or understand. If you even had a taste of how He loved you. I want you to think for a moment. What would Christ have to undo for you not to be saved? What would he have to undo to take your salvation? He'd have to take his Holy Spirit from you. That's a big thing right there. He would have to take your adoption away as a son or daughter. 
and you would not be alive anymore in Christ. You'd be dead back in your sins. I mean, that's a big thing. That's a big thing to, to, take, to change. We should have such confidence and joy in the grace of God. It's not my performance or my works that bring salvation. It's the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. Everybody say amen. And many people will fall. Many people will stumble. Many people will be prodigals. Second Timothy says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Thank God for that. Gosh, there's been a lot of times I haven't been faithful. Peter denied Christ. He didn't push, turn him away, did he? He pursued him. And let me just say, he keeps pursuing you. He'll pursue your friends. He'll pursue your, your relatives. He keeps pursuing you over and over and over again. And he's pursuing. He's knocking on the door of some of your hearts right now. Knocking on the door of those watching online right now. Hey, I love you. Turn. He can bring people back who are backslidden and fallen away. I love Isaiah. His arm is not too short to save. (laughs) This is such a good word. We should have the confidence in the grace and the long suffering. uh, 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 We should have confidence in his grace and long suffering in our lives. You know, I was thinking I heard this analogy of the day. I thought it was a great analogy. If I'm on the 20th floor of a high-rise building, I'm up there walking around without any fear. I know there's danger. Right? There's danger. I could, like, open the window and jump out, but I'm not going to do that. I have, even though there's danger all around me, I have this this confidence that I'm going to be okay. I'm not concerned. And so we should understand, yes, there's this potential of of judgment and all this kind of stuff, but perfect love casts out fear. I'm in the hands of God. I don't have to be afraid of anything. I'm just walking with the Lord. I got this confidence. Yeah, there's danger everywhere, but not me. I, I'm in the hands of Jesus. But however, this not, should not be a license to sin. It should not be a license to sin and live in rebellion, unrepentant sin. First John says, no one born of God continues to sin. Now, he's not talking about we, we all sin. Because he, he also says, if you say you're, you don't sin, you're a liar. He's talking about this unrepentant, rebellious sin that you just keep. So nobody who truly loves Jesus is going to keep doing that. They're going to be so convicted that they're going to turn back to the Lord. So then if, the, if you're doing that, you would need to question yourself. Do I really have a relationship with God if I keep going against him? So on the other side, though, we read some of these warning scriptures that I think we should take heed We can't just throw them out and say, well, well, well. Remember, every word, Scripture cannot be broken, every word. So we got to read them. Let's read them. What what do they say? It is impossible, in Hebrews 6, in the case of those who have once been enlightened. that, that, That means come to the light. Who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared. That word shared means partaken in or partnered with as a companion. Shared in the Holy Spirit. So anybody who is partaken with and partnered with as a companion of the Holy Spirit. To me, that sounds like somebody saved. And have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of age to come. And they have fallen away. That's the word commit apostasy. To restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm. And holding him up in contempt. Now apostasy is not just sinning. okay? Because we all sin. It's not even just falling in addiction. It's not even backsliding. Apostasy is that you have sinned so much that your heart becomes so hard that you eventually say, I reject over and over and over and over. I don't want this anymore. I don't want your gift. Hebrews 10. For we, listen, for if we go on, this is talking about, he's talking to Christians. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. He's saying, if that happened to Moses, how much worse would it be for those? How how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved for the one who trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? He was sanctified. That's the work of a, of, a, of a Christian. And outrage the spirit of grace. Second Peter 
For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, they've escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I hear that again and I think that sounds like a, a person saved. If they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them to never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it, turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. And then James 5.19 says, My brothers, he's talking to anybody called a brother is a Christian. My brothers, if anyone among you, among the brothers, wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. And it will cover a multitude of sins. Whew. So the question that we, we have to ask our, our, ourselves is we know that God will never leave us. No outside source can take away our salvation. No angels, no de demons, no tomorrow's problems or the power of hell. But I asked the question, and I'm not really coming in with an agenda. I'm telling you, I looked into this. I, 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 I really, I have, I'll share in a second where I kind of came from, but I'm just reading the scripture. Is it possible that a person could know Christ and say, Jesus is not losing them, but they are rejecting him? Over and over, and to cause somebody to forfeit their salvation. This is not losing it. This is a heart saying, I don't want this anymore. Now, you might ask, Jeff, where do you stand on this? <laughs> and I don't think my answer is going to be very satisfying to anybody in here. Um, because I, I think both scriptures need to be held in high honor. This is a century, centuries old debate. How would I come in here and say, man, I'm God's man of power for the hour and here's what God's word says. Right? I can't do that. This has been a debate for the last 2,000 years. There's a mystery involved in this whole thing. Do you see that? There's a mystery involved in this whole thing. I grew up in a church with a setting that absolutely you could lose your salvation. You could turn away from the faith. You could commit apostasy. And I'm not totally abandoning that today, but I will say something. I have studied this and spent time with the Lord this week. And I have been struck by the grace of God. Man. If we just could understand a taste of how much he loves us. We couldn't even stand up. How far he's willing to go for us. The robustness of the security of the believer is incredible. Yes, we will have moments of turning away. But let me just say, my previous thoughts on all this has softened drastically as I've studied the word of God, and I've said, oh God, you're so much more loving and graceful than I am. Thank you, Jesus. Where sin increases, grace abounds all the more. Man, if we could grasp it, the love of Christ. As far as the east is from the west, how far as he's taken our sin from it. He's loved you with an everlasting love. I, you just need to hear, somebody needs to hear this today. The love of Christ. It so out, goes beyond anything you can think. The devil's beating you up, all that kind of stuff. And you need to hear the love of Christ today. If I had to lean one way, I would say, which is a slight lean, I would say, you know what? I'm inclined to think that someone could possibly, and I don't think it's the norm, I think it's somebody who could c commit apostasy. Like I said, it's not just sinning. It's sin that leads to a hard heart that rejects God over and over. And you know what? You can totally disagree with me, and that's, that's totally fine. I, 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 we can still be friends. And I'll be the first to say, we don't know if that person turns back on their deathbed. 
We don't know if that person really was saved at the beginning. I'm just going off of Scripture. What, it, what I'm interpreting Scripture, I see some opening there for a person that could do that. And I don't really think it's worth fighting over. I'm so sick of Christians fighting over this dumb stuff, you know? Because the person, and it's not dumb, the Scripture's not dumb, but, but our fighting is dumb. Because the person who's in that state, does it really matter if they were never saved to begin with or they, they've committed apostasy? They're still there needing Jesus. I'm going to ask the worship team. We're, we're going to close out here, guys. Let me just, uh, just piano, if you don't mind, Brandon. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm done. 2 Corinthians 13. I want us to read this scripture and I want us to think. Because it's really not about where you came from, what God has done in your life in the past. You need to ask yourself, where am I now? Second Corinthians 13 says, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Other translations see, to see if your faith is genuine. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless... Indeed, you have failed the test. He's saying, Jesus Christ is in you, but if you've examined yourself, you might find out that he really isn't inside me. And that's not to bring fear or any of those kind of things. It's, it's just, we should examine our lives. Do I, am I experiencing the Holy Spirit's work? And, and I think probably most of you would say, yeah, God's speaking to me. Where are you at with God today? I'd like everybody to bow their heads for just a moment. Some of you, the devil has been beating you up every day. You're not saved. You've heard those words. You're not saved. You don't belong. And to you, I want to speak the life of Jesus, you are His. You are secure in His hand. Oh, if you could love, know the love of Jesus Christ in your life. Lord, I pray, and I want to pray, is anybody in here, this room, nobody looking around, but you, you've been, the devil's been beating you up and actually kept questioning your salvation. Anybody in here just be brave enough to raise their hand and say, I've been feeling that. Yeah? Whew. Jesus, I pray for every person in here. That the enemy has tried to steal the joy of their salvation. Give them a revelation of you today, Jesus. Give them an understanding of the love of Christ. It's so deep, it's so deep. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. It's just so deep. Oh, Holy Spirit. Fill them today with the love of Christ. Mm. I want those who raise their hand just to ask the Lord right now. Just say, Lord, I... Show me your love right now, God. I need to know your love right now. Just, just tell them, I just need to know it. I need to experience your love. Please, Jesus. And he's going to speak something to you as you ask that question. He's going to just speak it in your ear, in your spirit. There's another group of people in here that if you were to die today, God forbid, but if you were to die, if you were to leave here and something were to happen, you would not know where you would go spend eternity. And today you want to make things right. And I just want to, nobody looking around, but would you just lift up your hand if that's you in here. I need to make things right with God today. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So I want us all to pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, 
I believe you came to the earth. You lived a perfect life. And you died on the cross for my sins so that I could spend eternity with you. I believe you resurrected on the third day and I ask you to come live inside my life. Transform me today. Change me today. And then I want you to say, I surrender my whole life right now in Jesus' name. Come on, let's say it again. I surrender my whole life to you in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I believe the Lord wants to start you on a journey of total transformation, born again, life-changing experience. What we, just, what we heard Aiden say today, just everything's different. Everything's different. I'm telling you, everything changes. Your heart, the joy and the love of Christ will fill you. So I just want to ask you, I want to put that little uh, thing on the screen. I want, I, if you prayed that prayer, will you text to 94,000, life in Jesus? Can you put that at the beginning? It's at the first slide there. Um, there you go. If that was you and you prayed that prayer, will you just text this? Because I want some, either me or someone else in the church is going to reach out to you and pray with you and kind of talk. And we'd love to take you through our one on one program. It's a discipleship program, seven week deal to help you get grounded in the faith. Life in Jesus, one word to 94,000. Let's stand up. Do you guys feel encouraged today? Yeah. I know it's a little bit of a sobering word, but it's also a really life-giving word from the Lord today. So, Lord, I, I just pray a blessing on everyone here in Jesus' name. God, I pray, Lord, if there's anything, I pray, Lord, that throughout this week, those who are struggling with that salvation, Lord, they would have these beautiful moments with you. Lord, in their car, I just see you in the car just worshiping. Lord, have those moments. Lord, I pray for those that maybe are leaving here and they're going, I don't really know if I... What would happen to my life if I were to die today? Lord, I pray you would convict them, Father, and knock on the door of their heart. Lord, I pray the blessing of the Lord upon everyone in here. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week. Hey, Discover Resonate. If you're brand new, take 15 minutes to the fireside room. Meet one of us. And they're going to share just a little bit about the church. Take 15 minutes right at the fireside room right after this.